The Optimus robots will walk among you. Or it can be a teacher, babysit your kids, it can walk your dog, mow your lawn, be your friend. I think this will be the biggest product ever of any kind. Robots are coming for our jobs, right? This is a phrase that you've likely heard at some point in the last few years, and it's not a completely unfounded fear. Just a few weeks ago, arguably one of the most important strikes in recent human history took place in the US. The longshoremen, the guys who load and unload ships at ports, went on strike. This cost the US economy apparently around four and a half billion dollars a day. The strike was all about one thing, automation. The longshoremen were asking themselves, what's gonna happen when the machines take over our jobs? What will we do all day? Well, all of you become unemployed, obviously. And they accepted a, a raise of like 50% without guarantees about any anti-automation i guess that would be bad but like at least some kind of like yeah if you get laid off then maybe you get some money something like that so basically you're gonna speed run getting laid off and automated and, well, the thing is for most of human history we were like really optimistic about how technology would change our lives i mentioned before john maynard Keynes, who said that we'd work only three hours a day because of, of advancements in technology obviously this has not happened and the tide has kind of turned this technological optimism has slowly waned technology has already started to supplant jobs if you have applied for a job recently there's a 75 percent chance at least that your cv was read by an ai instead of a human and there's a lot of evidence that describes i think that's a 100 percent chance if you looked at the job apply sites there are hundreds thousands of applicants i guess in in very high roles, you might you might see more of a human touch uh, because like there are less applicants, but almost certainly there's gonna be some initial filter. ATS going through your CV. And by understanding that, we can begin to have some more informed assumptions about what might happen going forward. While I can be tempted to think of generative AI and of large language models as these completely, completely revolutionary brand new technologies that have appeared out of nowhere, the reality is that they're one element in a long line of technological progress that began in the 1980s with the computer revolution. And while today the idea of a desktop computer doesn't feel particularly innovative or special, it completely changed the course of the workplace. And when we usually think about how technology affects the workplace, we typically think of a manager walking into the office, telling you you're fired, and then as you walk out, you know, a Tesla bot or something walks in and takes your job. I'm always exactly <laughs> but the typical conception of how technology takes jobs is in this like linear exchange way where the workers get kicked out and technology just gets plugged in in their place. The, the reality is a bit more complicated than that. If we go back to the 1980s, we can actually see a different picture of how technology has affected the workplace already. I came across a really interesting paper called The Growth of Low-Skill Service Jobs and Polarization in the US Labor Market. And these guys looked at the last several decades of technological advancement. And they noticed that if you look at the change in employment, you actually get this really, really interesting little curve, this U-shaped curve. This U-shaped curve tells you uh, two things, right? It tells you that there's been really big growth in high paying jobs up here and tells you that there's been growth in low-paying jobs down here. The people who've been really screwed, the guys and girls in the middle. The major effect of technology since the 1980s has been this phenomenon called job polarization. Effectively, middle-income, middle-skill jobs have been replaced because they were typically the most routine ones. These middle-income jobs were mainly in things like manufacturing, bookkeeping, clerical work, and the jobs that have stayed are the lower-paid jobs, which can't be replaced by computer. This loss of like middle-income jobs has been catastrophic, especially in the US. They've seen it mainly in manufacturing, where millions of jobs have been lost since the 1980s to technology, as well as the loss of jobs to cheaper markets in other countries. While it's obviously sad, it can be tempting to feel like this is just, you know, this is a natural thing and these people presumably found something else to do. But it's had like really lasting impacts ever since the 80s. The loss of manufacturing jobs has been directly linked with the rise of opioid-related mortality. Fentanyl is also one thing to consider that you're basically paid the bare minimum. They can get away with it every single time. So, I mean, theoretically, I mean, no matter how prestigious, you can have a surgeon, right? And suppose like everyone was a surgeon for some reason, then a surgeon would be a minimum wage job, right? Is now in the US the number one killer of adults. And so more people looking for jobs and more are available for jobs than the more more the wages go down, I, I, I suppose. It's under 50. That's why countries just really love immigrants. <laughs> Partly to prop up the property prices, but also to uh, drive down the cost of labor. Which is crazy. And, and you hear it all the time that like in Canada, like they apparently just uh, hire people illegally for, to do the job. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Or maybe you have some family business <laughs> where you're you don't have workers, you just have your family members helping out, right? So that's obviously going to be kind of tricky for other businesses to compete with. And it's been directly linked multiple times with the loss of these manufacturing jobs. The loss of middle income jobs has not just you know pushed people into lower paid work or pushed them to retrain and get higher paid work. It's actually pushed a lot of people to just give up on the concept of work entirely. And these jobs don't actually all like disappear. Yeah, but how can you afford that? Here in the way that we think. It isn't a, a, a matter of these people being fired and then subsequently replaced by computers, by automated technologies. Rather, what we see is that whenever there's an economic down... Yeah, I mean, if, if it was like that, imagine if the cashier got replaced by the automated checkout and like and like high five go home just enjoy your salary that's not how it goes like downturn loads of people will lose their jobs and it won't be obvious that they're losing their jobs to technology but what will happen is that corporate profits will recover far more quickly than the jobs will and that gap is accounted for by technology if you were in that group of highly mobile middle income workers who had the chance to become a high income worker you've lost that opportunity this job polarization this like shift of middle income workers into two brackets because of technology has increased inequality across western europe it's increased inequality in north america as well and technology is affecting workers by sorting them into two groups, which have a very little mobility between them. Because if you lose the middle... 
it's not Vage though. I, I guess you can, yeah, you can say Vage, but at that point, like in Europe, like for example, making 100,000 would be amazing, pretty good. But in order to make 100,000, I mean, you can have just have 1 million in investments. And there you go. If you have a few million investments, then then your your wage would be like 100,000, assuming you ha even have a good one. If there would be no guarantees of that. But your money would make more money than you. In fact, for a regular, for the average person who has a house in America, your house makes more money than you. So, yeah, it's all about owning stuff. Have a very little mobility between them. <clears throat> because if you lose the middle income jobs, then you can't really go from a low income job to a high income job that easily. And, you know, some people might think, well, you know, I'm good. I work in technology. And I'm not susceptible to polarization because I'm in the industry. But the issue is, even if you are working in these industries, the future doesn't necessarily look as bright as it should do. This working paper out of UCLA measured the impact of internet adoption and how. Who says that, that they're good because they work in tech? I mean, sure, tech is, is a good job, no doubt, but it's not exactly secure, at least lately. And how that affected workers, how they affected workers specifically who directly benefited from this. Workers who worked in firms where internet adoption was helpful. And they found something that might not be that surprising if you, if you think about it, but even in those industries that benefited from technology, you saw massive differential effects depending on your social class. So if you worked in an industry that adopted internet, your wage would go up by 2.3% if you're an employee. If you're a manager, your average wage increased by somewhere around 8 to 9%. If you're an executive, your average pay increased 18 to 19% over the period. The internet can yeah, but this is just the guys who who have a job, right? I keep, well, everything else goes into the pocket of the, those who own the business. That completely was completely revolutionary, and it still had this huge differential impact, where the benefits were not distributed evenly amongst the, the people who should have benefited from it. The low-level employees who likely saw the greatest increases in productivity didn't see the commensurate increase in salaries. This is a classic case of uh, <laughs> hardest work and reaps the, the least reward. It's Yeah, also, <laughs> that's obvious. The, the obvious system is that the workers are exploited as much as possible. I'm not saying this as a, as, as a moralistic claim, just as an obvious one. I mean, you might say like, oh yeah, I'm going to be a total good person. I'm going to have a business and that's going to not exploit people, right? I mean, exploited in the sense that the surplus value doesn't go to them. But that's not how exactly how it goes because your competition exploits the workers, so you have to too. In fact, you might just beat them to it not created equal benefits for society already. Suppose you are one of the people that did lose their job to AI, right? The question is then, like, now what? Well, historically, the solution to losing your job to automation has been education. Education has been the one thing that has stopped huge amounts of people from losing income over the last 50 years. They've been able to... Also, it's not exactly quick. So, suppose you lose your job. And, like, how quickly you can retrain. And that's exactly just completely up to you as well, right? So, yeah, not, not so great. Assuming this is even an option able to adapt, they've been able to learn how to use the technological tools to be more competitive in the workplace, and they've been able to survive, right? I did show you this graph earlier on of how the job distribution has changed and how these middle-income jobs have been lost. And some of these middle-income workers have been able to go up here to high-income jobs through the virtue of education, right? However, even that idea of using education to, to beat the system is not so good anymore. As Prince Sun mentioned, you know, Google laid off 12,000 tech workers just months after a stock buyback. And today we actually have an oversupply of talented people. Too many people have tried to retrain. If you're a, a computer science grad, you'd like to experience the, the difficulty of trying to find a, a job in this market. Intel has been doing layoffs. Google has done layoffs. I think Riot Games is doing layoffs. ByteDance, TikTok is doing layoffs. And this idea that we can beat this increasing automation through education has led actually to a system where there are tons and tons of highly trained but unemployable graduates because there simply aren't enough jobs. This is particularly- It's, it's also worse because now you have tens of thousands, most possibly more, of experienced uh, professionals. And the new grads are going up against that. So, yeah. So, I'm not sure how where he's gonna really go. Now, you have to understand that if a company can hire someone, they're gonna hire the most experienced person. So, that means the, the new guys are not really getting uh, much of a chance. And in like five years, who's gonna be the new guy, right? I, I don't think those jobs are even coming back because, well, I guess... Uh, Programming is not dead by any means, no doubt, but possibly there are less programmers needed to do the same jobs, unless new jobs are eventually created. Which certainly could be true, because like, if, if not programming, then then what? Particularly a huge problem in China, it's a big problem in India, and it's also a problem in the US, actually. If you are a tech graduate, let me know what your experience of the final work has been. This promise that we can beat automation through education is starting to prove not as robust as it once was. More and more higher skilled workers are being forced towards low-paying jobs. Is it actually possible that we end up with two economies, that we could end up with the economy on the news and the economy and the economy economy? Yeah, so uh, what we're seeing is that there's an increasing separation between the value of assets and the value of labor, right? Asset prices have been increasing steadily mm. without stopping for an incredibly long time now. If you bought a house in the 80s, you'd be doing good. But if you've been working for since the 80s, since the 90s, or for the last 10 years, the growth that you've seen has been incredibly rapidly outpaced by things like houses, things like stocks. We're basically already in a dual economy because the value of assets has consistently been outpacing the value of labor. And this is affecting people. So do you own stuff or are you being owned by people, right? 
If you have a few million, then I guess you're an owner. If not, then you are being owned. People who were promised to be able to be liberated through education, to be able to have a good life through education, and are finding that the, the jobs that were once available are slowly disappearing. And I think it's very unreasonable to expect that at the increasing rate at which technology is developing, that it's going to be even a feasible option in the future to retrain yourself out of a job loss. It's quite unreasonable to expect, you know, every translator to become an AI engineer, for example. Even if that future was Some might make it, no doubt. But it is not realistic for society. I mean, at that point, you're just saying that, you know, Good luck. And, uh... <laughs> future was possible, even if the future where everyone who loses their job can retrain and can get a new job, it wouldn't solve the problem that we have because the, the gains that are being produced by this technology have been really inequitably distributed. And even with retraining, people are not regaining the purchasing power that they should be regaining. And when thinking about what the future would look like after all of this takes place, you have the optimist. The, the optimist will likely bring up some form of universal basic income, which is the idea that everyone, regardless of their social status, regardless of their employment status, of any kind of metric, will receive a fixed amount of money to spend on whatever they want. Yeah, but the thing is, people don't want to give away their money. I, I possibly cut flag for this in the past, but like, it is obvious. People, people have their money and they don't want to give it away. They want to make as much money as possible and they have the, the opportunity to give it away and they don't. And that's it. They want. The idea is that if enough people lose their jobs, then we have to begin to divorce survival from labor. And we have to accept that survival is not something that can be conditional on being able to work. Universal basic income is not a completely new idea or anything. In fact, it's been something that's been mentioned for hundreds of years, actually. Probably the best example is in the 1930s, this man here was a US senator, his name is Huey Long, and he began a movement after the Great Depression called Share Our Wealth. And the whole principle of Share Our Wealth was that living standards had dropped so extremely after the Great Depression that he believed that the state had a duty to, to rebalance things effectively, that they had a duty to tax the rich, and they had a duty to be much more aggressive with it. And he birthed a modern UBI movement. It actually was arguably the most, you know, the most popular, the most well-known UBI movement until he got shot and assassinated. Now, <laughs> what would the, the pessimists say? The pessimists might look at the fact that technology has increased inequality. Well, they should be taxing assets, not necessarily income, right? Not, not necessarily like jobs. I mean, you don't want to be discouraging people uh, making some money, but I mean, suppose they like oil. Who should benefit from like the country having oil? Is it should be everyone? And just to use an OG example, as it stands, they might also look at the fact that in the UK, something like two thirds of families in poverty are working families. And the pessimists might also look at the fact that we already, as a society, have decided that some people are not worthy of being paid the minimum wage. Uh, I've talked about this previously, but sub minimum not worthy the minimum wage. Yeah, I mean capitalism certainly does work, but it might not work in a way that is. That is good for most humans? Well, I guess at least all humans, right? Uh, I've talked about this previously, but sub-minimum wages are a really big thing across the, the US, across the UK and Europe as well. The pessimists mm -hmm. might see this and believe it's a trend that will be accelerated with more technology, that unless the gains are redistributed in an equitable manner, then jobs will continue to get more and more polarized as this, the amount of scale required to do those high-paying jobs increases. And sadly, this just... Is he taking a pessimistic stance here? Uh, this, this might be just realistic. It does feel more plausible to me. I really do want to see a world where UBI gains traction, but... Working poverty is already really normalized, and as Oethlip says, it's, it is one of the saddest things in modern society. And if we can justify- Yeah. Also, can you imagine, suppose, can you imagine how, how it feels to just grow up in poverty? You spent decades growing up in poverty, and you you can't even say that, oh yeah, uh, you, you, could, you should get a better job. No, you were a kid. That's it. You grew up in poverty. It was traumatizing. It was terrible. And what do you say to that? We just don't care. That's it. You, you can argue that maybe some some the big strong strong man uh, can can try harder but many possibly can't <laughs> hmm. justify working poverty already then we can continue to justify it even when it gets to the point when people are literally starving now obviously there's a, there's a degree of special people don't care right now what do you think they're gonna start caring later i, I think it's entirely tied to how much of a ruckus people gonna make speculation here there always is and i hope to see at least a push towards policy decisions that allow the the gains in the economy that are produced by automation to actually trickle down to workers in a way that they don't seem to have done thus far i don't know i don't think it's ever gonna happen until the robots start really taking the jobs but to explain my point so people might not hurt, hurt other people that's fine but if the robot comes to take your job then that robot might just end up in the river, right? So, yeah, you might see that. And at that point, people are gonna get uh, creative. I'll bet I'm not the biggest fan of UBI necessarily if people don't have uh, any leverage outside of it. Because at that point, they could be just uh, like Mark for the Purge. Like, imagine if you made like $1,000 per month right now. And that's it. But, but as as a trade-off 
you had no chance of getting anything more, would it be a good deal? Because that might be our future.